Hi, Marissa. Hello. How are you? I can't complain. Um, how are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> what a loaded question to ask these days, isn't it? Uh, it's doing well. As I well suppose. as can be expected. Well, the as good well news is be. that uh, you're not in America, right? I mean, things are more stable where you are. Well, just recently the news came out that oh, the oh, UK right. is the worst in the world for COVID. So oh, there's that. Out of the, out of the oh, frying yeah. pan into the fire, I'd say. I was thinking more about the chances of the government being overthrown, but we seem to we seem to be on a, on a more uh, even keel. I should say now we're we're, we're taping <laughs> this. Uh, it won't it won't will not post immediately, but we're taping it uh, on January eleventh. So l- let me introduce us. Uh, my name is Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Marissa Conway, co-founder of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. We're going to talk about feminist foreign policy. I've um, been talking to people from a variety of foreign policy perspectives, haven't yet covered feminist uh, foreign policy. You are the, um, well, as I said, co-founder of Center for Feminist Policy, and that is at, at uh, University of Bristol, where you're in the PhD program, I gather. And uh, you're also on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Is that true? It is true indeed. Um, although CFFP short for Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, because that can be a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's separate from the University of Bristol. So I am just happened to be doing my PhD at the same time because it seemed like a good idea so they, when I thought of it. Bristol is not responsible for anything you said. Bristol is not responsible, no. <laughs> now, are you at all ambivalent about this Forbes endorsement? I mean, as we will discover, uh, FFP is somewhat left-leaning Forbes is not known for being left-leaning. In fact, although you're probably too young to remember this, its official ad slogan used to be capitalist tool. The ads would just say Forbes, capitalist tool. So I don't know. How happy are you with this particular embrace? That's really interesting about that slogan. I had no idea. Um, it's It's a funny one, isn't it? Because so much of feminist work is about disrupting the status quo, um, kind of shaking up systems of power. And Forbes does operate in a space, <laughs> a bit of a perhaps realist um, status quo space, the very space we're trying to change. And having this kind of um, recognition from them is wonderful to have our work um, acknowledged in this way. Um, we got on my my co founder and I got on the list in 2019 for CFFP, and at the same time, it does feel very strange to kind of be part of this um, kind of a, it's it's a bit of an elitist situation being put on this list, being put up on a bit of a pedestal, um, and from my experience with. Forbes, it's really about who you know. So there is a huge degree of nepotism built into this 30 well, under 30 know? idea. Did, did you know someone? Is that the key to your being on this list? My co-founder did, yeah. She knew someone who was already on the list. And once you're on the list, you can nominate other people. I see. Um, well, that's not as yeah. bad as it might be. I mean, a system of, <laughs> of people nominating people. It's not as bad as like her last name being Forbes or something. True. That is true. Um, um, so it's, although- it's an interesting... It's an interesting thing to have, but I will say, I mean, at the end of the day, from a fundraising perspective, it gives us a lot of um, authority and recognition for standing out in our field that really helps because fundraising for feminist work is very, very, very tough. Uh, Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I will happily take that extra boost. Okay. Well, congratulations on that. So let's talk about... um... Feminist foreign policy. Now, I gather that it kind of got off the ground, and I and I get this from reading something you wrote. Uh, in uh, six years ago, Sweden adopted uh, feminist foreign policy as as part of an official fa- state policy. And you write that uh, its areas of policy focus uh, were known as the three R's: women's rights, backed with resources, and supporting increased female representation. Now, from your point of view, is the idea that increased uh, female representation was just a good thing from a standpoint of justice? In other words, women should be equally represented? 
Or is the idea that if women were in charge of foreign policy, foreign policy would be better, like there would be fewer wars or something? Is that at all part of the idea of feminist um, foreign policy? So in terms of women's representation, which I think is definitely just one slice of the larger right, right. in fact FFP we should pie. say that we should say that your writing expands on this in terms of what the ffp agenda is it goes it goes beyond these relatively kind of simple and and in some ways abstract things uh and we'll we'll get to that but um i'm just wondering if leave aside this particular phrase is that part of the idea because you hear this sometimes right like the reason there's so many wars is that men are in charge. You do hear that. My take on this is that um, including women in political leadership is a good idea. We know this, there are instrumentalist arguments for it. And then there's just the argument that it's the right thing to do. But I also think it would be a mistake to say that we will, you know, have peace. If we have only women in leadership, we know that women are just as capable of enacting state violence as men are. Um, so I think kind of taking a more holistic look at um, systems of power, at understanding how patriarchal values influence how politics is done um, is a much bigger picture way. But specifically um, when it comes to arguments for why including women is a good idea, a lot of it revolves around the simple fact that women do have different life experiences than men do. And particularly when we're talking about these life or death scenarios like war, for example, or, you know, launching nuclear weapons, um, I think it's very important that we have a very, very well-rounded, thought-out decision-making process with lots of different opinions, lots of different voices, lots of different experiences, all feeding into uh, policy, which, you know, touches every single one of us in really significant ways. So it's more about um, breaking out of this mold that we historically have had, which is that a very, very particular group of people are seen as best for making policy and, and kind of breaking that circle open so that we are onboarding as many different ideas and opinions as possible. Okay. There's a kind of related question. Um, you're very, um, when I say you, uh, I'll just kind of mean FFP. I'll mean you as a spokesperson for FF for, for feminist <laughs> foreign policy. Um, you're you're uh, unless you want to at any point distinguish between the two. But but um, you're very anti-imperialism, and like many on the left, you don't mean imperialism just in the narrow sense of actually having an official empire and conquering nations and bringing those into the empire. You mean to refer to like American foreign policy. Uh, as, you know, dominating less powerful states, sometimes using violence and war to assert a dominance over those states. And you're also anti anti-patriarchy. And, and again, this is a little like my previous question, but are those almost the same? Well, they're not the same thing, but, but they're, are they closely intertwined in your view, in, in imperialism as a manifestation of patriarchy or something? Really excellent question. Um, I will attempt to answer this briefly. Uh, yes, I think imperialism is a manifestation of patriarchy. And when, when, when I think about patriarchy and, and what that looks like, um, it's kind of fits into a system where certain people, certain, um, gendered racialized expectations are seen as best in a society. So this is where kind of hierarchies get put into place um, and enacted. And oh, man, this is such a big question. Um, <laughs> I think it's really understanding how, you know, if we take the U.S. as an example, a lot of its foreign policy is really kind of twisting arms to get what we see to be the best opportunity. And that can be what's best for the U.S. or that can also be what is what we decide is best for someone else. So it's a lot of this. Um, there, there's a good degree of arrogance, I think, that goes into foreign policy. And this is where particularly bringing in lots of different 
voices becomes really, really important. Um, it's, it's recognizing that we do not know what is inherently best for everybody and that we should be asking them what is best. And also moving away from this idea that power is a limited resource and that it's something that we constantly have to be fighting over. Um, there's a very strong sentiment within feminist activism um, about power sharing. So rather than focusing on power over, it's power to or power with, for example. Okay. The, um, so yeah, yeah, this, this, um, the idea of bringing more voices into, I guess, the, the foreign policy formulation process for one thing. I did, did n- notice in reading, um, in reading your stuff that you, 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 as you just suggest, you go beyond gender, uh, <laughs> in terms of kind of defining what kinds of voices we need to, uh, bring in. Uh, you write that, uh, FFP is concerned with the rights and needs of people who are marginalized for a wide variety of reasons beyond their gender identity. This includes race, class, and ability. You, you use the term, um, intersectional, which maybe we'll have time to get into. But I guess a question that just occurred to me is, is part of the idea here that if you bring into the conversation people who have traditionally had less power within society, they will do a better job of kind of identifying with or seeing the perspective of, like, countries on the international stage that are less powerful, if, if that, um, if that makes sense. Is that, is, is that, is that part of the idea that I, but, you know, because Americans don't, naturally ask themselves, like, what would it be like to be a country that America is deciding whether or not to invade, you know, or to take the extreme case, or even just a, a lesser case of, of uh, say, a country America is sanctioning, or or even in some subtler way exerting leverage over. Um, is part of the idea that it's just kind of naturally easier for relatively less powerful people within a society to identify with relatively less powerful societies and countries? I think this kind of has two answers. One is that foreign policy is felt very locally, as well as being kind of this big macro thing. Um, And it is also, feminist foreign policy also requires a domestic angle to this policy work. So it's not just about looking externally, but also looking within one's own country to think about how, you know, as we might be advocating for gender equality, there's a lot of um, foreign policy initiatives that specifically focus on like women's participation in peace building, for example. How are we within our own borders focusing on women's participation in society in a meaningful way? So um, it's not just about, you know, elevating the voices of the marginalized within our own country in order to once again, speak on behalf of a different country, but kind of um, just, just making, making space for, for um, people who have historically been ignored completely because their um, participation in these systems would require people to, give up this ultimate grip on their power and their seat at the top of the hierarchy. Um, So, you know, take like sanctions, for example, sanctions with, I've studied the um, Iranian nuclear deal a little bit and, you know, sanctions with the, the nuclear deal, it's, it's kind of set up in a way where we are pushing Iran to to change its behavior. So as a state, we want to see it make different governmental decisions. And in a sense, essentially what we're doing is punishing the government and the leadership for choosing to do certain things. Um, and this is one path towards uh, setting up consequences because we want them to act differently. But the people who actually feel the sanctions are not the people in government. They're the People living their day-to-day lives, just kind of struggling to make ends meet, they have absolutely no say over Iran's nuclear program. So a feminist approach to these kinds of things is really just actually stopping to think about who is going to feel the impact 
of these policy decisions versus who is making these policy decisions. And most of the time, these two people sit in completely separate circles, whether that's, you know, at a more state level um, or on a more individual localized level. Mm -hmm. Um, That's funny uh, because, I mean, in a way, in in America, the the use, the past use of sanctions on Iran is, uh, well, I guess considered by some progressives not nearly as egregious and, and uh well it, it is probably embraced by a certain number of at least liberals or people to somewhat left of center because it at least they were multilateral i'm talking about going back years ago they had the authority of the un some of them they actually led to an outcome uh that that was the 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 uh you know the the sought outcome Whereas usually sanctions actually don't even lead to any lead to what you know. It's like now there are there are uh, sanctions on 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 in Syria, Venezuela, Cuba, and and as a rule, you know, it's like uh, the goal is never reached, and, and so you wind up with just inflicting the suffering without really changing the state behavior. Um, the the Iranian sanctions are considered by by some people who are not on the right as to be relatively speaking a success story but from your point of view um not so much i mean leave aside the trump era right just just if we dial back <laughs> to where there was a nuclear deal um and you know most people would say well it's a good thing if there's not another country with nuclear weapons. Leaving aside the question of why we're choosing to focus on Iran, where, whereas we let various other countries have nuclear weapons and don't complain, leave aside the, the justice of that. Or, well, you don't have to leave it aside. Anyway, that's kind of open-ended question uh, about how you view that whole episode. Oh, man. Um, I would say a, a, like a feminist approach to foreign policy is very, very focused on um, looking out for the people who are traditionally ignored by foreign policy. So I think with sanctions in particular, um, it's kind of pausing to look at who will actually be suffering the consequences of sanctions. Um, and, and my personal thought is whether you determine, um, sanctions to, you know, quote unquote work or not to get this, um, desired outcome. Um, They in and of themselves inflict a lot of economic violence on people and create a system that further reinforces this hierarchy. And again, just like completely um, moves us so much further away from collaboration, which in the case of the Iranian nuclear deal, like we have achieved collaboration with Iran on their nuclear weapons and, you know, we won't get into the reason, cough, cough, Trump administration, why it didn't work out ultimately. Um, but again, it's this it's this hyper focus on being right and being powerful, being, you know, the protector, which is often how the U.S. positions itself when it comes to nuclear policy, um, making decisions on behalf of people who are deemed uh you know, not rational enough or um, not not smart enough. They're they're very othered in this process. So it's not to say that Iran should have nuclear weapons. I think no one should have nuclear weapons. But it feminism asks us to be very uh, thoughtful about how we approach things and kind of take that step back and look at like, okay, what are these dynamics here? Where are we seeing? odd things coming out to play where are we missing opportunities for collaboration where honestly ego gets in the way um and very masculinized worldviews get prioritized so i'll stop there yeah and i mean we should say uh from a strictly objective standpoint if you're viewing the whole thing from mars it might be unclear why we are singling out iran i mean uh you know we we Various uh, countries have nuclear weapons outside of the non-proliferation deal, right? Like, so uh, India, Pakistan, Israel, and we don't complain about that. And Iran is was a, a member, uh, 
I think in technical compliance with the non-proliferation treaty, it's not it's not clear that they were actually trying to develop nuclear weapons. I mean, that's kind of assumed, but it's not clear that they were at the time. They they, they seem to have at one point long ago had a had a program, but um, uh, and and they have the right under the NPT to give notice and get out of it. So it's not like they were even in violation of international law, or as if they couldn't have developed nuclear weapons in compliance with international law, should they choose to get out of the NPT. So, um, anyway, it's just, uh, it's my little sermon mm. on Iran and nuclear <laughs> weapons. It's, it, 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 it I, I mean, I just take your point that, uh, it would be reasonable to see, uh, this, this, uh, exercise of power by the U.S. and allies as in some ways arbitrary and coercive. Um, the, the, there's a related question kind of, you, you, um, you're very, um, it, it's interesting. From my point of view, it would be so wonderful if the U.S. started taking international law seriously. Like, <laughs> um, for example, and it would have uh, helped us avoid significant blunders like the invasion of Iraq was not legal under international law because uh, the Security Council hadn't authorized it. That would have been a way to bring it in compliance with international law. It didn't happen. So I would just be deliriously happy if the U.S. started complying with international law. I've noticed, though, that sometimes when I talk to people kind of, I guess, further left than me, um, they're not so wild about international law because you know, like legal structures generally, including national legal structures, it is not perfectly equitable, right? It's like in America, you know, in the American national system of law, if you get accused of a crime, you're much better off being rich. You can get a good lawyer and, you, and, and you're less likely to be convicted. And similarly, power is not distributed equally among nations under international law. There are five permanent members of the Security Council that that uh, are historically at least big, powerful countries, and they have disproportionate power. And I've I've seen you write about that as as, as a grievance, as something you want changed. You want uh, you would like the the UN to be in that sense more democratic. But the 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 question is, uh, in the meanwhile, that's not going to happen this year or next year. Uh, what is your view of the UN Security Council? Are you would you like me like to see uh, respect for its dictates? Uh, b- b- the idea being that that would be preferable to having uh, America having respect for no international dictates, or um, uh, do you just want to not participate in the system until it is more equitable? If that makes sense, I think you will get different answers you know, and I count myself as like a feminist activist in this sense, you will get different answers from different feminists. My belief is that we should continue to engage knowing that this, this big goal we're trying to achieve isn't going to happen overnight. Um, I'm a big believer in kind of breaking things down into baby steps and uh, celebrating these little changes because yeah, I, d- I don't think we'll see Security Council reform anytime soon. I'm quite cynical about this. Um, yeah, the P5 is is such a strange system. Um, That's the permanent, it, five permanent members of the yeah. Security Council. And just for people who aren't conversant in this, they have veto power. Unlike, there's also 10 members of the Security Council who rotate, but but the five, the, the big five... Uh, us, China, Russia, uh, England, and France can veto any Security Council resolution. Sorry, go mm-hmm. ahead. Interestingly, uh, three of the P5 are engaging with feminist foreign policy. So France has said they have a feminist foreign policy. Um, they haven't published anything. They basically announced it, said, like, we have it, and then haven't really done too much to follow up in a structured way. <laughs> it's a bit of a bit of a PR thing, uh, if I'm going to say my honest opinion. Um, There are actors in the UK government that have talked about feminist foreign policy and its importance. And I don't think we're too far away from seeing that realized. Um, And just this past year, 2020, I want to say in October, there was a House resolution brought to the floor calling for the US to adopt a feminist foreign policy. So 
you can kind of guess based on some of the things I've said that a feminist foreign policy is pretty radical in its approach to policy and what it prioritizes. It completely flips this very kind of realist oriented system on its head. So to have, you know, P5 countries who do have quite an exceptionalist mentality when it comes to their position on the Security Council, be committing or be moving towards the commitment of these feminist values integrating into their foreign policy. I just, I am fascinated by this. And, um, and I'm, a, a lot of our advocacy work at the center is increasingly going in this direction of like, what does it mean for these very powerful states to say they have a feminist foreign policy? Like what do activists, what do civil society um, people expect from them when they say this? So I can tell you, for one, getting rid of nuclear weapons is pretty high on the list. You can't say you have a feminist foreign policy and be in possession of nuclear weapons. And I think Security Council reform would also kind of clock pretty high on that list as well. Okay. Um, the, you know, a lot of... Uh the things you're in favor of sound like things um, that the left generally is in favor of. Uh, I mean, maybe that's not so true as we drill down a little and and we will, but is it, I mean, is it, uh, is there, is there a distinction? I I mean, um, are, are there, are there things that might be, uh, prized on the left generally that, you're not so enthusiastic about or things issues you would emphasize more than are issued on uh, emphasized on the left generically. Yeah. Um, I think particularly in the States, the left is still pretty preoccupied with quite neoliberal ideas of what being progressive means. And there are, you know, varying definitions when it comes to feminist foreign policy. And I will say that I think, us at the center, we do have the most radical idea of what this agenda should look like. Um, but I think really prioritizing this intersectional approach that you mentioned before, which is not just looking at gender equality, but looking at how all the different social categories come together to, you know, either give someone access to power or prevent them from accessing power based on their identity um, and really putting at the heart of any work anti-racism. And this to me is just one of the biggest struggles we're dealing with in the States right now is um, I think just a, a lack of willingness to really truly engage with anti-racist work. And I think there is a lot of lip service paid to it within the Democratic Party right now, but I don't think there is actual engagement with what it means to be anti-racist. And, um, how, and how does that play out in foreign policy in particular? I mean, you know, living in the UK right now, I see this really strongly with colonial legacies. Um, I think the decolonization movement across many different sectors, not just foreign policy, but education as well, for example, is huge. Um, There's a lot of energy behind this. And it's really about recognizing how colonization has fundamentally shaped our societies and how we understand the world. And most of the time it is actually, I would say all of the time, it's been, um, it's, it's supported systems of violence rather than um, brought us any closer to peace. So part of, so part of it, I mean, an anti-racism agenda is, is recognizing how racism as a domestic issue is a legacy of foreign policy. It sounds like that's part of it, but it's also seeing a, a system in which largely white nations exert dominance over nations consisting mainly of non-white people is an example of racism? I mean, is it both of those things? Domestic racism is a foreign policy legacy and then foreign policy is an expression of racism? Um, I think all of those. I I mean, I think it wouldn't necessarily be accurate to say that racism is due to foreign policy. I think it's a kind of self-fulfilling circle that we have racist foreign policies because of domestic racism. And this feeds into each other and creates this system. But I think in the sense that 
we see these things very uh, play out domestically and also on a global stage between states. Um, there are huge divides, and I know these terms are, you know, a bit problematic, but huge divides between the global north and the global south, for example, um, and a lot of that is falls around colonized lines um, and this this very uh, a a preference still for very Eurocentric westernized ways of doing things. And um, a lot of these systems are rooted in white supremacy. So um, in terms of addressing the, the, that kind of imbalance, um, what are, uh, do, do you favor like, you know, economic redistribution? Are there, I mean, are there, are there ideas that presumably kind of aren't on the policy agenda in the Democratic and Republican parties in America, for example, that you're just not hearing about that, that you would favor by way of redistributing resources? Yeah. Um, I think reparations is very important. Now you mean domestically um, in, in America or? Uh, just as a general concept, regardless of the context, I think it's but a how would that play out important... on the global stage? I mean, I thought in America, the idea behind reparations was these are uh, descendants of people we enslaved. So we we owe them something. Um, it would de- w- the idea would be what on a global stage, there would be specific societies that we have uh, victimized in some way that we would make r- material reparations to or what? So my mind uh, with this question goes to a UK context and how many countries the UK has colonized and the kind of lasting legacies of violence that are still ongoing to this day. Um, so in that sense, um, y- yeah, <laughs> I do think that there is uh, justification for this um, at a global scale as well as a domestic level. So a common criticism of this is is not a criticism in principle, but more a criticism in practice. In other words, man, this would be complicated. <laughs> you know, in other words, like mm. you calculate what is owed. Now, in America, you would face huge blowback uh, from uh, the right, from kind of uh, probably a certain number of Trump supporters, among others, and not only them, uh, but uh and then the question becomes and, and and I guess the idea is it becomes a kind of Pandora's box. I mean, who isn't a descendant of someone who has been victimized by the system? And and if you take that globally, it's like, wow, how do you figure out, you know, it's like, okay, we did this to Mexico in the nineteenth century. We had the we supported the Contras in Central America in the twentieth century. I mean, how do you begin to realistically start come let alone you know i mean come up with numbers let alone numbers that wind up passing muster in the within the domestic political process in say america that is going to have to approve of these things right seems kind of like a tall order it is a tall order i'm not going to pretend like i have the answer to this and there are um many, many people who are, you know, doing incredible work in this area. And I think this is a, you know, a particular situation where I also have to acknowledge, like, I am a white woman. And there are women of color, particularly, who would be the people to listen to. And I think this is where the the feminist lens comes in is, you know, it's not sitting somewhere thinking like, hmm, how do we do this, but actually going to the people that have been wronged saying, what do you want? Like, what would make the difference for you? Um, That is how I understand reparations. Um, And and I think, you know, of course, there are so many things that have happened over history in so many different contexts. But again, how I see reparations is that there are things that have happened in the recent past that still have an impact on people today. So one of the examples that just really grinds my gears is um, the weed industry. So weed obviously is becoming legal in different states and um, there are a lot of like weed entrepreneurs now. I'm sure there's a much, there's like a 
an official term marijuana entrepreneur, um, but a lot of startups that are um, that have just blown up in the past however many years um, around weed. And like I, my sister and her husband live in Colorado. They run a social media firm and they actually do a lot of um, social media for some of these companies. So I've seen them. They are insanely profitable. And almost all of the entrepreneurs that I have seen are also white. So they are capitalizing off of this legislation change that is bringing them in some serious, serious money. And at the same time, we are still still dealing with a lot of people in color who are in prison for possession of weed, which in many places is now legal. And just the disparity between those two systems, one where white people are making millions and millions of dollars um, based on a legislative change, where in the same sector, if you will, or dealing with the same substance, people of color have been um, sent to jail for ridiculous, ridiculous amounts of time. And we're so slow to be doing any sort of policy change there. It's just, it feels like, you know, walking through mud or whatever to get that change done. So I think for me, this, this context kind of paints it in a way where you can look at something and see how are people who are typically um, favored in society benefiting from something where people who typically are oppressed in society are suffering from something. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm wondering what you would do. About, I mean, there's two separate issues, getting the people out of prison uh, and then, but sounds like separately, you would like to see um, more of the entrepreneurship in this new industry and I assume many other industries uh, in the hands of uh, people of color and maybe women as well. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, this is not the hill I'm going to die on. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. I, I, do I, think I hadn't this actually is planned to get into the, I hadn't <laughs> actually gone into this conversation <laughs> planning to talk about the dis- distribution of marijuana growing opportunities <laughs> in Colorado, but, mm. uh, but go ahead. Um, Again, I think this is one where I am simply observing something that to me looks ridiculously unjust. I myself do not have the answers. I think the best people to talk to about the answers are the people in the industry. Um, And I do think there is a responsibility of marijuana entrepreneurs. I'm sure there's a better phrase for this. Um, Mm -hmm. There is a responsibility that they do something from a system that they're benefiting off of. Yeah. Yeah. so I, I would assume the uh, the pandemic. I haven't seen anything you've written about the pandemic, but I, I would assume you're not delighted with the the way vaccines are being distributed globally. I haven't written anything about the pandemic because I have been exhausted by the pandemic. Um, oh, the only thing I've written is a, a response to Hawaii's uh, feminist economic recovery plan to COVID, which is awesome. Um, we can talk about that more if you want to. Um, well, go ahead. I'm curious. I mean, what is distinctively feminist about a, a given recovery plan? It's a plan that centers women at the heart of its response and talks a lot about economic reform. Um, and Hawaii particularly uh, has a, a very strong colonial legacy as well. And um, its industry largely revolves around tourism and the military. And there's a lot of exploitative practices that feminists in Hawaii are not fans of and want to change. So they want to shift their economy away from that and move it to more towards a, um, um, a circular economy, um, a care economy, these sorts of things. And, and it would be, you said uh, more put women more at the center of the policy. How would it do that? Oh, if I can take a second to actually look up the plan, I can give you like oh, you, oh, you specific have to examples. Um, oh my gosh! I mean, we, my we short-term memory people. is truly what, what could, what awful. could they Google? I guess is 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 maybe that'll that'll suffice. Uh, the Hawaii <laughs> uh, feminist um, something. It's called uh, "Building Bridges, Not Walking on Backs." Mm-hmm. And if you just Google Hawaii feminist economic recovery plan, it'll be the first thing that pops up. Okay. Um. I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, human rights. You've written that uh, you want to place human rights at the center uh, of policy. Now, 
among American progressives, well, among anti American anti war types, uh, and I include myself there, there's some ambivalence about this or some a recognition that this is a difficult issue to reckon with because uh, human rights have so often been a reason cited for military intervention. And, um, and, and I think sometimes sincerely, maybe sometimes sincerely, maybe sometimes less so, but, uh, you know, for example, the Libya intervention was initially an intervention aimed at protecting civilian populations that seemed to be endangered by uh, Qaddafi's soldiers who were poised to to visit devastation on a particular city. Um, there's almost always some claim uh, of a uh, big human rights issue in these kinds of situations. I mean, somewhat famously in the run-up to the, uh, not the most recent Iraq War, but the Persian Gulf War of the 1990s, there were people testifying before Congress uh, that uh, under the Saddam Hussein regime, people unplugged incubators to let babies die. It turned out that was not true, and the, these were just PR people hired, you know, by uh, by somebody who wanted to to get us into a war. But on the other hand, there are genuine, there were certainly genuine human human rights abuses uh, by Saddam Hussein, um, and so there's, you know, I've noticed you've used the term realism. Uh, a few times as a kind of, from your point of view, I guess, a term of disparagement, or at least a term that represents a worldview you're opposed to. Um, there are a certain number of anti-war types. I mean, I've written about progressive realism as as a thing that I like. Be uh, you know, People can Google my name in that if they're curious. But, um, uh, and, you know, r- r- realism tends to be skeptical of uh, uh, um, uh, tends to to want to be very selective about cases in which America intervenes on behalf of human rights, certainly militarily, and 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 wants a more restrained vision in terms of uh, America's, uh, you know, I guess wants America to have a more uh, humble idea of how much good it can do how fast in the world because it seems so often the desire to do good has been used as a reason that ultimately gets us into wars. I guess you take my point. This is, you're asserting uh, human rights is something you want to put at the center of foreign policy. There are people who think that that idea has been used to get us into a lot of wars. I'm sure you've heard this, thought about it. What's your take on that? I think human rights in a neoliberal context, absolutely, has been used as this justification. One of the examples that comes to mind is, um, it was a speech that I want to say Laura Bush did around 9-11 that was talking about saving Muslim women, saving them from themselves and saving them from brown men, essentially, as justification for the U.S.'s intervention. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is horrible it's horrific it's um not in alignment with feminist thinking i would say so when we talk about human rights um we we definitely are talking about them from the context of radical feminist theory um and away from this kind of more traditional lens of um human rights and i think when it comes to this critique on realism in particular, um, you know, realism looks at states as uh, ultimately competitors. They're competing against each other for power and it sees power as this limited resource. And so using discourses around human rights to justify this competition power grabbing, which in the case of, the war in Iraq was completely fabricated um, for oil, essentially, and for power. Um, so this to me, like, I mean, this sits so far away from what a feminist foreign policy is interested in. Um, and, and I understand that, like, human rights in and of itself is a very 
loaded term, uh, but when we use it, we use it in the sense of protecting um, the, the, the very fundamental basic rights of someone to just exist and live in the world and have equal access to opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I mean, leaving aside how you uh, define human rights, there's kind of the question of what you do about human rights violations. So currently, mm -hmm. you know, China's uh, treatment of the Uyghurs has gotten a lot of attention it's not totally clear what's going on over there, but it's pretty pretty clear that it's uh, uh, something not good and uh, that, that people have been involuntarily confined uh, who are Muslims and for some reason are, are uh, viewed as suspicious by the Chinese state. Uh, seems like at, at a minimum hundreds of thousands of them. Chinese call these re-education camps, but it's, it's certainly a case of involuntary confinement. Uh, and, uh, and then there are various other things alleged that are worse, but, uh, I, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with all this. And the question becomes, so what do you do about it? And, uh, I haven't heard anybody recommending invading China. Um, but the, you know, there are, uh, people who would like to impose economic sanctions. You have said that sanctions often wind up victimizing just the populace of the country broadly without doing any good. So is there a, I mean, I, 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 it's in a way unfair to, to pose <laughs> this question to you because nobody that I know of has a very compelling answer to this question in terms of how you actually make things better for the Uyghurs. But um, is there a, is there a take on this from your point of view? What a question. I absolutely don't have the answer. I think to this, I would just default to say, what are the people, what are the activists doing work on this issue in China telling us that they need? And then that's where we support. I think that's the best bet at seeing change happen. Okay. It's uh, I mean, it's a good question. What the, I, I, I'm sure there are people over there who'd qualify as activists, it's not as easy to communicate with them as it, or, or to identify them yeah. as it was maybe 15 years ago in China, because um, the, the place has become more authoritarian than it was, I think, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so the, um, you mentioned radical feminism, and I realize one question I haven't asked you is, what do you mean by feminism? Uh, you know, the mm. feminism began as, uh, uh, you know, with, with goals like letting women vote, we've gotten past that. Uh, and but uh, and so then there's, I guess, second wave, third wave feminism. I'm not that clear on what these things mean. Do you want to talk a little about what you mean by by feminism? Yeah. So um, we've touched on this idea of intersectionality. Uh, a couple of times now. So I, I definitely root my ideas in intersectionality, which is that feminism is much more than just women's rights or even gender equality, but really takes a holistic look at power and who can access power, who is prevented from accessing power and why. And um, this becomes much bigger than just gender equality when you frame it in that sense. So it's really about looking at people who are historically marginalized um, and for various reasons don't have access to opportunities and are struggling um, to have a full life because of systemic issues. Um, so it's quite like a systemic lens that I that I understand feminism. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there. OK, so I guess um, the idea is that to you, feminine goes beyond beyond gender issues for starters. Definitely. Now, is that I'm, I'm curious, is that a, a widely uh, agreed upon thing kind of in among most people say left of center who would call themselves feminists? Feminism really means different things to different people and manifests in different ways. And, you know, not all feminists agree. Um, I think there are some pretty hard lines that we can agree on. If you're trans exclusive in your feminism, then that's not feminism. Um, but beyond those kind of hard lines, I think um, there's a lot. It, me, it just means different things based on someone's lived experience. Um, and it will mean 
a different thing to someone in various parts of the world. So there is a, um, a good degree of context that comes into play. And, you know, my experience is definitely grounded in growing up in California and now living in the UK and particularly in London, the, the feminist activist scene is just incredibly rich. And there are so many wonderful thinkers and there's a very, very strong anti-racist thread that runs through all of this work. So that's been very influential um, on my own understanding of what feminism is. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of you living, uh, you living in England, um, I, uh, I'm curious about your take on Brexit, uh, because on the one <laughs> hand, I mean, on the one hand, the, the, the Brexit movement, of course, draws on some kind of ethno-nationalist sentiments that I feel uh, sure um, you don't approve of. Uh, on the other hand, you know, the European Union, I would guess, from your perspective, has its pros and cons just in the sense that um, international trade agreements um, often have what you would, I guess, uh, characterize as a neoliberal flavor, right? I, uh, uh, I mean, I mean... The European Union is to some extent of you uh, a, a, a case of capital having its way if if with a more left-leaning take than capital has its way in American trade agreements, right? So mm -hmm. what uh, – I, I, I'm just curious about uh, – I mean, you know, Brexit it seems to have – I guess it's finally actually happened. What uh, – how do you feel about that? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> it's just one dumpster fire after another, isn't it, really? Um, <laughs> you you I, mean life generally, not just Brexit, I take just it. Just generally, absolutely. COVID, Brexit, oh, so Capitol Hill. Um, what do I think about Brexit? I think it's trash, just to be blunt. I think it's, as you uh, mentioned, really rooted in... Um, these very white nationalist ideas um, about what it means to be British. There's a lot of fundamentally racist uh, views that filter into, that has filtered into Brexiting campaigning, for example. Um, I agree that, you know, things with the EU weren't perfect, but to me, this is a nonsensical answer to trying to address those issues. And it has very little to do with economics and is much, uh, has much deeper roots in immigration fears. And I think those fears in particular have been stoked by a lot of conservatives here. And the Vote Leave campaign um, was pretty nefarious in how they went about um, emphasizing in sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle ways that Brexit was something that could protect us from the other, which often was um, quite an Islamophobic idea of what the other was. Um, the other in quotes. <laughs> I realize this is a yeah, podcast. I, I, I take um, it you, that you're not embracing otherism. Uh, I am not embracing this at all. I think the way they have spun what Brexit means there, uh, the government is trying to reestablish itself as an empire um, and, and drawing on this bizarre colonial rhetoric, mm. you know, this global Britain 2.0 trying to, to um, reassert its place on the global stage. Like these things are all just so deeply rooted in this very, this like huge colonial nostalgia. Um, and it's just, Oh, it's a disaster. I think we will be, feeling um the negative impact of this for years to come now that that's interesting that you view it as having a kind of imperial having kind of imperial overtones because um i mean i, I it, it it certainly seems nostalgic in some ways uh but mm -hmm. but in america you know its counterpart which is a you know kind of trumpism supposedly includes a skepticism about using military force in ways that you would probably view as imperialistic, right? In fact, it's been accused of being isolationist. Mm -hmm. um, now, is I guess that's not maybe such a big issue in Britain because Britain, well, they haven't been involved in as many wars as the U.S., although they've gen generally been supportive of our adventures over the last 20 years. So is that not... Um, 
is there no anti military anti war anti intervention flavor to the kind of brexit movement in the way that there is with uh trumpism I have not got a sense of that. That's a really interesting question um, and something I'll have to think about, actually. I haven't had any inherent sense about that. Uh, I think the the love of... Um, the UK is a very nostalgic country, and there is a real love of... Um, the military history here that mm-hmm. I think doesn't quite manifest itself in the kind of patriotism we see in the U S with our army and everything. Um, and instead of like currently looking at the army or forward looking, maybe with the U S military, the UK tends to look back um, and, and kind of romanticizes the military happenings in the past mm-hmm. Um so in that sense, I don't think it's been hugely influential in how people understand Brexit. I think it's been my sense is that there's just been much more of a focus on, um, yeah, a fear of immigration and what that means and um, tying that to uh, the economy and sort of the the middle class or working class and making them believe that immigration is the reason why they are struggling. Mm -hmm. Okay. So final question, uh, unless there's anything you want to add after it, the, the, um, as I said, we're taping this, uh, January 11th. It may not, we may not post it until, uh, after the inauguration, but in any event, are you hopeful about the Biden foreign policy or is it the case that, you know, from your point of view, I mean, it's safe to say that you are to the left of the average (laughs) Biden foreign policy advisor uh, and probably to all of them. Um, (laughs) So from your point of view, is it kind of like Trump versus Biden on foreign policy is one kind of badness versus another kind? Or uh, or do you welcome the change? I mean, strictly from a foreign policy point of view, leaving aside the other reasons one might welcome it. I think Trump has really... Uh, destroyed good relations abroad. Um, the U.S. has become a laughing stock around the world. Um, and I am very hopeful that Biden will be able to rebuild these relationships because, again, I mean, you know, feminist foreign policy and what I'm interested in is building collaborative relationships between states. So I am very, very hopeful that this is something he'll prioritize um, and and do well. I think there are, you know, the usual concerns, a lot of the things we've talked about in in the past hour of, you know, these neoliberal ways of doing foreign policy that I definitely don't agree with. Um, but I'm I'm gonna let hope get the best of me today <laughs> and say that I do think we will see positive change. Okay. Well, from your lips to God's ears, is there anything else you want to say uh, Um, about uh, feminist foreign policy or the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy? And uh, yeah, I'm. I'm, uh, If if people are interested in learning more, please head to our website. It's centerforfeministforeignpolicy.org, and it's center spelled the British way. R e. Ooh, tricky. Um, (laughs) Ooh. C e n Um, t r e. Okay. Yeah. And I love talking about this, if this wasn't obvious from our chat now. So if anyone wants to strike up a conversation, please get in touch. I'm on Twitter, Instagram. What's your Twitter handle? Email uh, Marissa K. Conway. So you can find me there. M-A-R-I-S-S-A-K-C-O-N-W-A-Y. And yes. I am at Robert Ryder, W-R-I-G-H-T-E-R, uh, on Twitter. And, and and what about Instagram? What's your... Same on Instagram. Same Marissa on Instagram. Marissa K. Conway. One okay. or two S's. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much. Congratulations uh, on being on the Forbes 30 under 30. Thank I, I'm, you. I'm hoping they'll develop a 60 over 60 list. Uh, I probably still wouldn't be on there but but uh i'd have a <laughs> hey, better shot that's what i thought before i got on the 30 under 30 list i remember meeting someone and thinking wow they're on the 30 under 30 list how do you do that <laughs> and then a couple months later i was on it so put that it out happen. there
It could happen. Well, you've left me in a more hopeful mood than I began the day, and I, and <laughs> oh, I thank you for that. that's really good. <laughs> I'm really uh, happy. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Marissa. This was fun. Thank you so much.